so this is um, some feedback on the chemical oceanography part of the oceanography exam um, for the main exam uh, for 2023. So this hopefully will be use for those of you who are having to do the reset or in, I guess, hopefully in future years, you can use this for uh, revision help. Um, so I'm just going to hopefully, yeah, just go through first the, um, the first two questions. So questions, uh, I guess, one and two here, I think there might have been questions nine and 10 on the on the exam. So these are the short form questions, you have to answer both of these. And then there's a choice of two further slightly longer form questions. Uh, and you only have to answer one of those. So obviously, I guess the first piece of advice would be that if you don't answer the questions that you have to answer, then you're not going to do very well on the exam. So do read through the instructions, make sure that you answer enough of the questions. Okay, so the first two questions. So the first one, uh, why is water such a good solvent for elements like sodium and chlorine? How do these elements ultimately get removed from the ocean? And a uh, second question about uh, concentration profiles of nitrate and calcium. So if we just look at the first question here and kind of try and decode what that is actually asking us to do. So you could kind of rewrite that for yourself as basically why is water a good solvent? And then specifically, why is it good for sodium and, and, and chlorine? And then how are they removed from the ocean? So again, if you, if you didn't really address all of the parts of the question, then uh, you wouldn't have got as many marks as you would if you had addressed all of the parts of the question. So make sure that you, you fully decode uh, what the questions are asking you. Um, so I'm not going to go through uh, an entire model answer for these questions, but just to give you a kind of hint of the kind of things that we were looking for uh, in the in the in the, in, the, in an answer uh, related to the, the lecture content. So um, some indication of uh, the structure of the water molecule would have been useful to explain uh, how it gets the properties that lead to it being a good solvent. In this case, it's the uh, slightly polar. Uh, nature of the individual water molecules leading to um, uh, 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 an ability of those molecules to kind of uh, extract uh, ions from a solid, in this case uh, sodium chloride, and kind of pluck those out to, to dissolve them. Um, but one part that was quite often missing in uh, uh, an answer here is to explain why the solubility of these uh, elements of, of chlorine and sodium is so high is because not just that they can get plucked out of the solid and into the dissolved phase, but how they can get surrounded by water molecules in this so-called kind of hydration shell and not be allowed to re-precipitate back out. So they're kind of held in solution by the water molecules surrounding them and isolating them from uh, their kind of opposing uh, uh, atom, or sorry, ions, so the, so the chloride and the sodium atoms can't meet each other in the water because they're surrounded by water molecules, so they can't precipitate out, leading them to have a high solubility. Um, then I guess another aspect that was, that was missed out by some people was that they explained why uh, water was a good solvent, but then didn't address the, the second part of the question, which was really asking about uh, the removal mechanisms. So for elements like um, chlorine and, and, and sodium, these are very soluble elements, so they're actually very difficult to remove from the ocean. So you either have to evaporate most of the water, so I made it in some kind of isolation uh, basin where the, the water can evaporate without being kind of replenished by fresh, uh, um, by not fresh water, but replenished by ocean water to so that the concentration of chloride and sodium ions can increase to such an extent that they can actually precipitate out, um, or you actually remove the water itself. So if you, if you basically throw little bits of water out of the ocean in, say, sea spray onto land, that removes the dissolved ions in that water. Um, similarly, you don't have to remove the water by kind of sea spray. You could subduct it down into the crust um, uh, as pore water, and that would also remove these highly soluble elements from the ocean. So there are other mechanisms as well, you could have gone into some of those, but um, uh, that kind of thing is the, the kind of explanation we were, we were looking for. So moving on to the second um, question now, so show how typical concentration versus depth profiles of nitrate and calcium differ in the ocean 
and explain the processes that cause these changes of concentration with depth. So again, this is a question that's got multiple parts. Let's have a look at kind of decoding these. So basically show typical concentration depth profiles. So that's us basically asking you to draw a profile of nitrate concentration with depth in the water and a profile of calcium concentration with depth in the water. And then some explanation or some description of how they are similar, how they are different. Um, and then the last part of the question is really to ask you to, to describe some of the processes that are causing those concentrations to change down the water column or not change as it, has, as it happens um, for each of the, the, the two, two um, uh, I guess, the, the nutrient nitrate and the, and the element uh, calcium. So let's start off with some of the uh, kind of things you, you could have put in. So this is, uh, these are some, some slides from the, the lectures showing kind of nutrients like profiles. So you can see over on the left, um, uh, a phosphate and a nitrate profile. Um, uh, and uh, so one of the things you could have included in your answers is, is, is a, like a sketch of these or a description of, of how the concentration changes. So the kind of things we're looking for is, uh, with nutrient like profiles, so with element, not elements, but nutrient compounds like nitrate or phosphate, uh, the concentration is very, very low at the surface. And that's because uh, at the surface, the nutrients are used up uh, by organisms um, uh, because they're nutrient elements. And then as you go deeper in the water column, the concentrations increase as that organic matter that's produced in the surface sinks down to the water column and is uh, basically decomposed, uh, releasing those nutrient elements back into the into the kind of dissolved phase. Uh, then in the very deep ocean, then you might have concentration changes that are related to ocean circulation. And you can kind of see that over on the, on the right hand side here in the kind of the deep ocean and water sinks down in the North Atlantic, it brings with it very low nutrient concentration water. Um, and then as that water circulates around the deep ocean, its concentration gradually changes, gradually increases as progressively more and more organic matter falls down into the deep ocean and the organic matter is respired and the nutrients are then released. So that would that you could use some of that to, as part of the last part of the, the, the question asking you to explain the differences uh, and I guess to explain the differences, you, you should also have, have shown a profile of the calcium concentration. And this was uh, quite often missed out in, um, in many of your answers. Um, so just to think about what a calcium profile kind of should look like uh, in the ocean, uh, we talked a fair amount in, in the lectures about the, 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 this um, concept of um, residence time and um, conservative versus non-conservative uh, elements in the ocean. Uh, so with an element like uh, nitrogens or, or nitrates in the ocean, um, it's added and removed at a rate that's, that's quite fast compared to the, the mixing time of the ocean. So we see large changes in concentration of these elements. And I guess you can see these over in this, this diagram here. So changes of you know, from almost zero in some places to, to quite high in others, uh, because it, particularly in the surface ocean, that element is being removed and inside it's being added by, by ocean upwelling maybe. Um, and that's happening at a rate that's faster than the ocean can basically mix it all out. But for elements like calcium, uh, the rates of removal uh, compared to the, the ocean kind of mixing time are very, very, um, uh, very low rates of removal. So it has a very long residence time, um, which means that kind of any kind of process that's adding or removing calcium will be happening too slowly to affect the concentration before that concentration can be evened out by ocean mixing, uh, which is why kind of the concentration patterns of all of these elements over on the far left hand side, sodium, chlorine, cal calcium, magnesium, their concentrations, the pattern of concentration is the same everywhere and there's actually very little concentration change. You can see that the scale on this doesn't go to zero, uh, so the concentrations are never depleted. Um, and what we're looking at here is basically changes in concentration due to not changes in the elements that are dissolved in the ocean, but changes in the amount of water that's diluting those elements. Um, so in, in lower salinity kind of areas, you might have lower concentrations where you might be having more fresh water added from rainfall. 
Whereas in regions of more evaporation, you might have slightly higher concentrations, but only small relative changes. So if you actually look at um, uh, some concentration profile data, um, so this wasn't in the in the lectures, but this is kind of just to kind of like make the point that uh, uh, I guess uh, variations in calcium concentration. So these were some measurements that were made relatively recently in the ocean, and um, you can see that there is some variation in the concentration. Uh, uh, I guess you can see that the different uh, sites are. Uh, shown in, uh, I think, in the different colours here. So they're very similar concentrations. Um, salinity is low. Uh, depth here is kind of a bit higher um, at the surface. Uh, maybe a little bit more ev evaporation going on there. Um, but that's not really affecting the calcium concentrations much. Now you can see that there's variation in this diagram over on the far and right hand side, but you can see look at the scale at the top. These are tiny relative changes. So if we actually plotted this on a on a scale of kind of zero to I guess 10,000, the concentration profile would look something like this. So there'd be no change in concentration with depth. Um, and that's because it's got a very long residence type. Now, quite a lot of you did talk about the processes that might be adding or removing calcium from the ocean. And you can kind of see these going on in, in, the, in this really, really high precision data that's been measured here. And basically, there aren't many data in here because normally people don't bother measuring calcium because the variations are so small that they're very hard to see any differences. But you can see that there are some kind of, uh, uh, kind of depletions in the surface. I should point out that the, 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 the dashed lines here are the kind of the concentrations, okay? Um, but most of that concentration variation is due to the addition or removal of fresh water. So that's just due to the changes in salinity causing concentration changes. Um, so quite a lot of you talked about processes such as kind of shell formation that would be changing the calcium concentration. And, and if you take out the, the salinity or dilution effect, so that's the, 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 these solid lines here, you can see that there are subtle changes in the water column due to those processes, but they are very, very small. So I think you got some credit for, for mentioning those processes of additional removal of calcium, but really what you needed to say that those processes, the rates of them are very, very small compared to the mixing rate of the ocean. Uh, so any concentration changes are, are very, very small. Um, right, I'll, I'll kind of stop there um, just to kind of give you, um, uh, this was just to give you a kind of a, oh, there we go, a. Um, uh, a hint of, of what kind of stuff you could have had in that, that question. Um, so yeah, so you needed to also kind of like think about, you know, explaining some of these processes of you know, what's happening in, in, in these additional removal processes. How are nitrate being used up or how is calcium being used up in the, in, in the surface ocean? What are the processes behind that? You could have had some of that on here. So the, um, uh, moving on now to the uh, longer um, form questions. So there are two to choose from. Uh, one about uh, ocean heating and how it will affect oxygen concentrations. And one about um, uh, organisms on coral reefs and how they can change uh, the pH of the ocean. So looking at, uh, I guess, question uh, three, first of all, I guess looking at, first of all, explaining how ocean heating will affect oxygen concentrations. That's the first part of the question. Uh, and then what impacts those concentration changes might have. So first of all, I think it would be useful to think about answering these questions in terms of like, what are the concentration profiles or what is the concentration distribution of oxygen in the ocean? You could go explain uh, some of that. Uh, and then um, have some discussion as to what are the processes that are causing changes in oxygen concentration. And then you could then say, how will ocean heating affect those processes and therefore then affect those concentration patterns. So you can see here, this is a, um, a slide from, from the lectures showing kind of a oxygen concentration profile. And you can see that there's lots of variation there. So there's, there are processes that are causing that variation and that could be exchanged with the atmosphere. Um, so that's basically the solubility of uh, oxygen in water. Um, and you could then say, well, that solubility is temperature dependent. So 
that would then explain how ocean heating can affect that one process. But there are other processes that are going on that affect the oxygen concentration. Photosynthesis is one of those. So maybe higher temperatures, you might have higher rates of photosynthesis, but then you might also have higher rates of respiration. Um, so you might want to think about how those uh, play off against each other in terms of determining the oxygen concentrations. Um, other things that you might want to uh, think about are, you know, uh, what else could be affecting rates of photosynthesis and respiration. So it's not just dependent on light and the availability of, um, uh, I guess, uh, carbon dioxide, because that is uh, very abundant in the ocean. Um, but photosynthesis also need nutrients, needs nutrients. So you might want to think about how temperature or ocean heating, that might affect nutrient supply through stratification or ocean mixing changes. So there are lots of different ways that you could kind of embellish or not so embellish, but, but go about addressing this, this, um, this part of the question. So yeah, so you could have looked at uh, describing how ocean minimum zones are affected by um, ocean heating through a combination of you know, changes in the solubility versus a change in ocean mixing or stratification. Um, and then discuss you know, what are the impacts of that kind of changes in oxygen. So if you were to completely remove the oxygen from the water, you know, what impact would that have on ocean food webs? But also what impact might that have on some of the other uh, chemical systems in the ocean, like the nitrogen cycle, for example, which um, is strongly impacted by the presence or absence of, of oxygen. Um, and you could have also used some examples of, you know, how we have observed these changes happening. So with these kind of longer form questions, um, there's scope for you to add in information um, that kind of supports your arguments, not just kind of explaining the process, but maybe giving some of examples of how this has actually been observed uh, in, the, um, in the past. Okay, so uh, moving on to question four uh, now. So this is explaining uh, how different organisms on the coral reef ecosystem kind of affect um, uh, uh, local seawater uh, pH, so the acidity of the ocean. Um, so I guess before we go into this kind of thing down at the bottom, which kind of explains the different processes, uh, I guess one of the things that's in this question, I think it says explain how the growth of different organisms. So I think there would be a need to kind of have some explanation of kind of what different types of organism you might expect to have on a coral reef ecosystem. And then which of these processes, each of those kind of groups of organisms can do or can affect. So um, there may be groups of organisms that do photosynthesis, um, but don't do carbonate production or, or carbonate uh, dissolution. There might be groups of organisms that produce uh, calcium carbonate, uh, but don't photosynthesize, some that do both. Um, so having some kind of discussion about the, the different kind of types of organisms and what they do on a coral reef would be important for answering this question, as well as explaining the chemistry behind these processes and then how that, that affects um, the, the pH of the, of the ocean. So yeah, so um, some kind of uh, brief kind of like overview of what the different organisms are on a coral reef, and then going back to kind of like explain with um, some of these um, chemical details, you know, how each of those processes can change um, the acidity of the water. Um, uh, again, you could, uh, I guess, uh, further expand on your answer with some examples um, from either from the lectures or from, from some of your uh, maybe wider reading about how this is actually, you know, how this plays out in the, in the real world. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll leave that here with this, um, I guess this, I guess, example of a, a coral reef organism um, that affects the pH of the ocean. Um, uh, yeah, so hopefully this um, has been a useful video for those that are having to, to, to um, reset the exam, but hopefully also for some of you uh, that are watching this from next year, so future people, um, uh, for what kind of things we're looking for in exams and how you can better prepare yourself for, um, for the exam. So I'll stop there uh, with the stop button. Here we go, stop.